I'm Kirk Harnack. On This Week in Radio Tech, we're cramming for the National EAS test coming in November. Chris Tobin joins me for This Week in Radio Tech, next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is This Week in Radio Tech, episode 103, recorded October 19th, 2011. This is only a test. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Tello Systems and the new VX Voice over IP multi-studio talk show system on the web at telos-systems.com slash VX. Hi, it's time for This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Glad that you're along. This is the show where we talk about all kinds of things that have to do with audio, audio that is Broadcast quality, what does that mean? We, we talk a little about that. We talk about uh, transmitters and RF and, and even receivers and propagation. Sometimes we get into ham radio stuff. Sometimes we're into very digital uh, modes of operation for, for broadcasters. And once in a while, we even touch a little bit on TV. That's just radio with pictures, right? Hey, on the show with me on this episode is uh, Chris Tobin. Hey, Chris, how are you? Hello, Kirk. I'm doing well. I'm with the uh, Music Cam USA folks. We manufacture... Uh, Let's see, audio codecs over Ethernet and uh, video codecs over Ethernet and a few other things in between. And uh, that's, that's the disclosure there so everybody knows what's going on. But I'm doing well here in New York City. It's raining, though. It's a rainy night, so uh, it's, uh, it's kind of wet. It's, uh, it's the same, same here in Nashville. It is raining here. A big system uh, came through and dumped some rain on us yesterday, and we still have it going on. And it's, uh, it's raining over a good part of the, the southeast U.S. and apparently over your way, too. But, hey, that's, that's, <laughs> I guess this isn't the weather show. That's a different, that's a different show. Um, our show is brought to you by the folks uh, who are also my employers. Uh, that's the folks at Telos, Omnia, and Axia. Telos, makers of uh, phone systems and IP codecs. Uh, Omnia, makers of uh, high-quality uh, audio processors for AM, FM, and Internet. And uh, also Axia, folks who make uh, audio networking and routing and mixing console systems. We thank them for their support. On uh, This Week at Radio Tech, uh, we talk about a lot of different things that have to do with, with audio and, and broadcasting. Uh, sometimes we have guests on. And I would imagine, by the way, the, the AES convention is occurring. It starts actually tomorrow uh, with some uh, sessions and uh, continues on into Friday. Uh, this is uh, tomorrow, which would be the um, 20th. Also Friday the 21st of October and Saturday the 22nd. Uh, I'm going to be there uh, along with, um, I think, a, a few of our listeners to the show um, will be there as well. I'm doing a, a on a panel talking about uh, IP audio streaming and also backhaul audio. Uh, Chris, are, are you involved in any of the panels there this year? Yes, I will be on the panel regarding backhaul with you and uh, Bruce Bernson from XM Sirius Satellite Radio as well. The three of us will be doing that panel. Oh, good. Okay. Well, I look forward to that. Um, and uh, uh, if, if you haven't registered, uh, you can still go to aesbroadcast.org. No, no, that's a .com. aesbroadcast.com and get yourself registered uh, for that. You still may be able to get in the exhibits only for uh, for free. Uh, so anyway, please check that out in our uh uh, our friend David Bialik, who's been on the show a few times, uh, talked to us ab about the stuff that's going on. But if you want to know about it, aesbroadcast.com, and uh, you'll see the various sessions going on there for, uh, for broadcast in engineers. Um, now, there is some uh, other news that's, that's coming up soon. And, uh, uh, Chris, I guess we ought to go ahead and talk about that. And that's this EAS. EAS stands for Emergency Activation System. It is a system that some broadcasters don't like. I wouldn't go as far as to say hate, but uh, you know it's 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 a it's a pain, and yet it's a service, and it doesn't work well, but it could work oh, well. It could work better. It could possibly work great. And there are changes afoot in EAS, uh, specifically with this uh, system called CAP, that is designed to uh, these changes are designed to make EAS work more reliably and be able to get uh, information out, perhaps in a more high quality manner and in a more uh, sure manner. Uh, because EAS for years has relied upon a daisy chain of broadcast stations to get word out to, to folks. Uh, just um, a couple weeks ago here in Nashville at our SBE meeting, 
uh, we had a terrific presentation by Jason Cooper. And Jason is the chief engineer for WSM here in Nashville, Tennessee, where I live. Transmitter's just a few miles away from my house. Big 50,000-watt, diamond-shaped, Blahnox Tower. And, and uh, they really pump out a lot of power. And they are one of the uh, PPAC stations. So they have uh, some uh, direct linkage to, to uh, uh, the emergency services. I, and I think, I, I, maybe I'm talking out of school here, they have a pretty direct connection to the White House, uh, as do the other PPAC stations. Chris, I've probably talked beyond the extent of my knowledge. What can you add to what I said? And tell us uh, about the EAS test that's coming up that everybody is talking about. Well, I'm looking to do on November 9th a national EAS test to uh, test uh, basically the ability to alert the citizens of this fine nation from a uh, higher federal level, uh, federal government level. Uh, and yes, the PCAP or PPAT uh, stations, the ones that the LP1s and LP2s listen to, have direct connections to, we'll say, you know, the White House, Department of Homeland Security, that kind of thing. And the, uh, the ultimate goal is to be able to transmit a message from the higher levels of the executive branch to the nation. And then coming on November 9th, the goal is to test that nationwide, and the FCC and a few other agencies are going to be monitoring, and broadcasters are going to be on alert to make sure they do it right. So part of that will have the National Association of Broadcasters, the NAB, working with PSAs, uh, public service announcements, leading up to the event. At least they're asking radio and TV stations to promote it through that manner. I think uh, up the week before to try and do a somewhat heavy, heavy rotation, if you will, uh, of these spots. But um, just pepper them in now and between now and November 9th, just let people know what's going on. Uh, it's just a simple test. It's real quick. It'll uh, just forward a message. And then off we go. We're done. And then we sit back and do the, the uh, Monday morning quarterbacking and find out what, where the weak links are. Uh, and people are still preparing. I believe I just talked to a radio station the other day. They're, um, they're in the process of installing some brand new uh, EAS decoding equipment for this, uh, for this big test. That's, that's in the simplest terms. If you want to get real technical, it's, you know, it's not worth that, that craziness. It's too early to tell how it's going to turn out. Do you have a feeling like it's it's really going to be like Y2K, like it's going to happen just fine and everything's going to work okay except for a few stations here or there? Or do you think there's going to be some some major problems? As I say, uh, like we had in Mississippi, we had uh, we had a, a perfect test of the Mississippi uh, uh, dry cleaning network, you know, where after the test, dry cleaning commercials went on the air all over Mississippi because they didn't run the, the end of message test. Do you think it's going to go like that or is it yeah, it's going to go pretty smooth? I'm I'm thinking it'll go smoothly only because we've been given a heads up. We as broadcasters have been given a heads up for some time now, and if if that fails, uh, it would have to be somebody who has not been paying attention. Literally, I'd say in the the very far distance of the communities in any particular region, you know, places where they literally are unattended, and you know maybe you know they check in once every six months. It's very possible. But I think in most parts of the country, in the urban centers and large suburban areas where broadcasters are very active with communities, I, I don't think you're going to see a, a hiccup like that. At least I, I'm hopefully not envisioning a uh, you know, Orson Welles, War of the Worlds type of thing where Lake Ridge, New Jersey suddenly becomes the epicenter of, uh, you know, of chaos. But uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I think we're going to do well. And you know what? If, if it's like lifeguard duty on a beach and you've been practicing and practicing, when the test comes... If it's quiet, goes according to plan, that's a good thing. You know, if it, does, if it falls apart really bad, well, we didn't prepare properly, which is not a good thing. So that's how I look at it. I'd say we probably have a 90% 90, 90 chance of it going the way it should. The 10% where we may have some trouble might just literally be something we overlooked or um, because it's optional for some folks that they may not have opted properly and, and the ES just, you know, lingered. Hopefully we won't have any dry cleaning commercials on the air, though. That's, that's, that's a hope. The, the, this EAS, nationwide EAS test, is going on November the 9th at uh, something like, what, 2 p.m. Eastern time, thereabouts? 1 p.m. Eastern time? Uh, yes. Yeah, somewhere around there, yes. And um, I, to my way of thinking, if it doesn't go well, uh, there's, there's two, two things that happen. If it doesn't go well, uh, it... Well, broadcasters will be will be embarrassed that it didn't, or whoever was responsible for it not going well could could be embarrassed, and other media, including the own our own radio media news, gets hold of that and uh, points out that broadcasters aren't prepared for and and it and that on the one hand I think that sounds worse than it really is. Look, if there was a national emergency, and um, the Joint Chiefs of Staff or President Obama 
uh, got uh, on, you know, and wanted to hold an emergency press conference. I can tell you that um, any station that needed to, any station that wanted to, would be carrying that press conference via their own uh, state news network or national news network, whether it be ABC or CBS or Fox Radio News or whatever it may be. They're going to throw it, or NPR, they're going to throw that on live and carry it with or without the EAS system. So if, if, there, if there's something uh, like that, like getting the president on the air, I, I don't see that EAS plays a major part in making sure that gets done. Um, now, if, it's, if you have an emergency where stations are unattended or you have some kind of local emergency like a weather or an amber alert or a tsunami alert, that, that kind of thing, where, sta where it's really fast and, and, it's, it has to be un and it has to happen whether the station is attended or not, then uh, I can see where, where making sure this stuff works is very important. Tell me where I'm wrong. You're not wrong, but I, oh, I think, okay. um, I don't know, I, the, the problem we're going to have is if something does go in a bad way, not a bad, uh, hurt, you know, um, fatality-wise, but just didn't go the way we thought it should or as expected, you know, you have the issue of broadcasters aren't prepared. Not true. You know, we know for a fact as broadcasters on this program and those of us who work with broadcasters every day, in many communities, if not all, broadcasters are always prepared to handle we'll call them emergencies, whatever they might be, natural disasters, man-made disasters, whatever the case is. And they do come, you know, the call to arms takes place and it's, it's done right. Unfortunately, and I've said this before on many other broadcasts, we've done netcasts, EAS is not treated like program content throughout the radio station is. It is just a, it's mandatory, I gotta do it. You know, it's like getting a driver's license, like, okay, gotta uh, do it again, uh, here we go. Mm -hmm. It's there. We, you know, we all tend to drive erratically or do something different, but we have a license, therefore we're allowed to do it and, you know, beg for forgiveness. That's part of the problem with this test is going to reveal those, that mindset. You know, I work for a broadcast entity on 9-11, and I can assure you that we were uh, prepared as we could be possibly for any emergency we can think of. And that day, we were distributing programming across the country via satellite. We were in touch with every city agency, including the mayor of the city, the governor of the state, and um, got the information out to where it had to go. You know, it, it happened. It happened the way it should. Did it happen in an organized form that you could take a book? You know how, like, some people like to have a book in front of them. Well, yeah, we went page 42. You guys did exactly as protocol B call, you know, calls for. You know what? Unless it's part of your day-to-day -day regimen, it's not happening. And the only people that do that are people in the military, law enforcement, medical, you know, emergency medical services, and uh, that's why they do what they do, and they do it well. So November 9th, we'll have some interesting outcomes. But, you know, to take it negatively and to try and run with it and make something that it's not, that's just wrong, and it's an injustice to both the people trying to make it work and those of us as broadcasters that, you know, we know it, it happens. Things happen when they do, and we make it come together. EAS, until it becomes part of the program psyche, it's just going to continue to be in this you know, I'll call it an ad hoc state. Hey, uh, uh, Burke, uh, I don't know if you got the uh, link or not. A little inside baseball here. Uh, Burke, I sent you a link to a YouTube video that I would love to see uh, that video, at least about 30 seconds of it, um, in uh, two or three minutes in, into that video. The first uh, minute or two is um, uh, some graphics that aren't real exciting, uh, although they are informative. Uh, but uh, yeah, a couple minutes into that. There's a great video on YouTube that uh, was just put up. And um, let's see who, uh, who put that thing up. It's in the Radio Mag Online account. So if you want, if you want to look up that, it's um, the, uh, the name of the video is National EAS Test, E-A-N Demonstration. And this is, um, oh, th this, is uh, this demo is voiced by Barry Thomas, who was our guest uh, a couple, about three shows ago, uh, the 100 uh, show uh, where we were uh, talking about uh, 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 war stories. And so Barry Thomas, uh, I don't know if he put this together, or, but he sure voiced it. And um, um, anyway, it's, um, uh, it, it's, it's worth watching because it, it shows you exactly what's going to happen during this test on November 9th. So you can be, uh, be better prepared for it. Hey, Burke, uh, any chance that that video is, is ready to roll a couple minutes in just so we can see a, a little bit of it? It's going to take me a second. The machine that I have, that we can show it on, doesn't have sound. So I have to. Oh, okay. Yes. So give me a couple minutes. Do you want us to whistle along? <laughs> well, I, I can play it without audio. No, I think the audio is just a little bit important. So yeah, let's, let's take yeah. me a second. I'm just going to email the link to myself.
<laughs> okay, no problem. So we'll uh, we'll watch that and we'll uh, put the link in the uh, in, in the show notes uh, as well, so you can see that. I think every engineer ought to ought to watch this video. Did did you see this video pop up um, uh, on on any uh, uh, tweets you get and, and like that, Chris? And Chris's volume is down. Sorry, my dog came in earlier and squeaky toy noise was behind me. <laughs> Yeah, we were uh, I have not heard from anyone in particular about that video, but I uh, did check it out. The video was very informative. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It is. And, and, and the methodology for doing the demonstration is also explained, and the EAS um, uh, duck farts. You know, the 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 same codes are uh, are not real, so uh, you wouldn't want this audio to accidentally get on the air somewhere. And so, in case it accidentally did. The, the, at least the information is not real because it cause it could cause a real problem if this was the if if uh, anybody accidentally played this audio on a radio station somewhere, right? Absolutely. Thank goodness they were thinking forward and, and made sure it wasn't exactly, you know, formatable in that in that case. That's good. But no, it, it was All a right. good video. So, uh, you know, Chris, I, I gotta believe there are a lot of stations that that look at EAS as ah something we gotta do and. Um, you know, at, at my own radio stations, sure, we, we have the gear in the rack. We have uh, we have the the fixed tuned radios. Uh, you don't have to use a fixed tuned radio, but we do. We we bought all the right radios. We have outdoor antennas um, uh, to pick up the uh, uh, the NOAA weather radio uh, to pick up the uh, the LP one that we're assigned to. I'm speaking in, in Mississippi here, by the way. Um, in American Samoa, our station is the LP one. And we're just a bit far removed, uh, although we're apparently getting um, uh, a fair amount of gear from the from the government uh, to help us uh, uh, keep American Samoans informed at, at our station there, uh, KKHJ FM. Um, they, I, don't, I don't think they've installed it yet, but they're going to come. They're going to send a contingency down to American Samoa to our radio station, to install a couple of generators at the transmitter and a generator or two at the studio. And uh, I'm not sure what else equipment we're going to get, but uh, somehow we're going to be in touch with the White House. Uh, there in American Samoa, so it should, should, should be interesting when that happens. Um, but uh, sometimes I'll go into our own stations in Mississippi and just double check and make sure that we're receiving uh, stuff. Uh, and it's, it still seems like from time to time we don't receive a test properly. And I'm just, I'm just not convinced that it was sent properly. I'm, I'm not convinced that the people who should be paying attention to this, the people who are sending the, the, uh, the, the, the tests, uh, are all are, are doing it right. Um, yeah, so I guess what I'm saying is I'm not sure that the government agencies at the local and state levels uh, or even at, at the weather services are, offices are doing what they're supposed to do. What's your experience? Is it better in New York? You're finding things are happening the way they're supposed to? Well, I will say that in New York City, uh, the local government, the city government has done a very good job. I've worked with them over the last several years on procedures for EAS for alerting and all the various tests that we've done and procedures and redundancies. And we've actually streamlined the SOP, the standard operating procedures for dissemination of information through the city EAS and the broadcasters very well. Um, weather service, for the most part, has done pretty good. The problem you'll run into, and this is, a, this is the design of the system, you can have a monthly, say, monthly test comes in, EAS test, and then followed by a weather service alert. You just blew out the monthly test, and you didn't know that, and then you went to relay the monthly test, and you got a weather service alert. So um, those are the things that the system still has in it that, you know, need some thought put into it. And I'm not sure if the agencies all involved will ever talk to each other in a uniform or unified you know, uh, arrangement. But New York City, I can speak, definitely got the act together, have it in place, procedures. Uh, there are, There is an actual person or two persons that monitor EAS or devices at the Office of Emergency Management. Uh, there are people assigned to it. Uh, when an alert goes out, uh, and a test is done, it is done with precision, I will say. And I do know of several other cities uh, across the country that they're in the same shape. So you know, if the broadcasters and local government get together and do it right and set aside the, the fences and the, you know, the, the boundaries of juris jurisdiction, you can make it work. If you don't, yes, you're right. The things will just be chaotic. 
Well, uh, with the video is ready to go. Burke's going to play that for us. And so what we're going to watch here is um, we'll, we'll, we'll watch it until we're tired of it. Uh, the whole thing is seven minutes long, so we're not going to watch the whole thing. We're starting a couple minutes into it. This is the National EAS Test and EAN Demonstration. And, uh, yeah, a couple minutes into this, Burke, uh, uh, fire away. Uh, yeah, there we go. Let's, just, let's watch it there, and, uh, and I'll tell you when to stop. This is the FITS code that will be used for the November 9th National Test. The current SAGE Model 3644 Digital Index was used as the radio station unit. This unit was about to be installed at radio station WQXI in Atlanta and was programmed with the appropriate default settings for the station and the Fulton County, Georgia local area. Recordings were used to provide the EAS originating message and to simulate radio station programming. For the test, we used a variation of EAS copy that's part of the Georgia State EAS plan. The message was read a number of times in order to fill 2 minutes and 30 seconds, which will be the approximate length of the real message. Since we did the test, FEMA released the actual copy that will be used on November 9th, but the message length and the results should be similar to this demonstration. Three, two. This is an emergency action notification test. All broadcast stations and cable systems shall transmit this emergency action notification test message. This station has interrupted its regular programming at the request of the White House to participate in the National Emergency Alert System test. If this had been an actual emergency, most stations would remain on the air, providing news and information to the public in assigned areas. This is WQXI Atlanta. We would continue to serve the Fulton County area. If you are not in this local area, you would tune to stations providing news and information for your local area. You are okay. listening to the All National right. I, Emergency I Alert that about enough that Because that, that message basically repeats they wanted to fill two and a half minutes to, uh, to make the whole thing, thing run. Uh, but well, I was particularly interested in the graphic at the beginning of that where that just showed they had this special EAS unit that's used um, at, the, at the national level uh, or Perhaps there are ones like that also used at, at the PPAC station level, um, of which there are a couple dozen or three dozen or so. Yeah, that graphic right there. Um, so yeah, so the, the, it had a FIPS code for Washington, D.C. And then the, the blue arrow that, that's going diagonally down to the, the blue unit, uh, that would be, you know, whatever is all the intervening stuff between um, that test unit that, that's generating this test and the local radio station. Uh, Chris, can you comment on, on this uh, setup and, and uh, uh, what what you saw there and versus what stations can expect to happen on the on November the 9th? Well, that's pretty much what the stations should expect. Uh, normal programming taking place, sports, news, music, whatever you're doing. And then the usual uh, EAS or the you know, EAN in this case is going to be the alert. Uh, tones will come in, get decoded, and then relayed accordingly. If you set your boxes up properly, they'll interrupt program material as, as it should. And uh, off it goes in the two minutes and 30 seconds worth of an announcement. The boxes that you observe, the blue one is what typically is used at the radio station side. The gray one would be the encoder uh, used for special encoding for monthlies, uh, for anything you're doing. And in the case of this is for the EAN. And the EAN only comes from the White House, or the executive branch. And that's how, that's how it's going to work out. I think it's important to note that, you know, broadcasters need to alert the audience in some form or shape that this is coming but not in a dramatic way, just so that when they, just think of it, you're at home, you're in the car, you're at work, you're listening to your favorite radio station, all of a sudden this comes on, you're familiar with the tones. Let's just assume that you're an audience that gets it and goes, yep, okay, it's that test, I see it on my cable TV, and I've heard on television, watch the bars, and I hear it on my radio station. But then what you normally don't hear is this is a message from the White House. So think about it. <laughs> yeah, that could be you're not paying could... attention. You're not paying attention. It's out of yeah. context. It's off, off axis from your, your hearing auditory canal. And all yeah. of a sudden you hear something about tones. I'm sorry, you hear tones, the usual thing, and then you hear the words White House, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, whoa, what's going on? Think about it. Yeah, yeah. You, you, we, it, this is a test. We have to promote it in the sense of it's just a test to make sure that we're prepared. And that's all it is. Not to, you know, not to get yourself all worked up. But think about what you just heard, that script that was just recited. On that video, when you're listening to that, did your ears at least subconsciously or something just perk up 
when you heard those words, the White House? Give sure. it some thought. Sure. You know? Yeah. yeah. How, how often are we paying true attention to what's being said by the spoken word on a radio station when you're busy doing other things? You're not. But you are monitoring. Your, your, your brain monitors key words. Let's, let's use that phrase. Key words, key phrases, and all of a sudden you stop and think. I'm just saying, Austin Wells did it, did it to us uh, how long ago? <laughs> Quite a while ago, before we were born. Uh, but yeah, we, 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 all know, we all know the story, sure. So let me ask this. If, if uh, At the beginning of that video, the part that we skipped, uh, there, there are some instructions uh, about how to make sure that your station EAS decoder is properly uh, programmed to make sure that this national test is going to be received. And most of uh, my understanding, if, if, I, if I got the message right, that out of the box... Uh, EAS decoders uh, from the various manufacturers and the ones they showed there were from, from Sage. Um, these, these decoders are already programmed to handle the national level test. If I got that the newest right. Ones, they, yeah, the, the, the newest, newest ones, ones okay. are. I forget, yeah, I forget when that started, but I do know I can at least speak for the Sage units that I've worked with. You can get the, uh, the necessary updates from them on their, I believe it's on their website. Uh, but if you've purchased any of their stuff within the last couple of months, if not longer, I think they're ready to go. Cannot speak for the TFTs or the others that are out there, but yeah, well, there are, it's an easy, yeah. easy check. At the beginning of that video, there are instructions that uh, that tell you uh, what to look for in your particular uh, EAS receiver, and they they also have a a, a uh, uh, there's some some website information. We we skipped it at the beginning of the video, but we're going to put the video's um, uh, URL uh, in the show notes, and you or you can search for it too on YouTube. National EAS test. E A N demonstration. Uh, you can also go to uh, the account Radio Mag Online, and that's uh, under Radio Mag Online. There's quite a few different videos about the broadcasting business, uh, including who who you know some from uh, the, the sponsors of the show. Uh, also, there's a, a, a five minute video on there from um, uh, Leif Clayson about the about the Omnia Nine and from other manufacturers too. So check that out. Uh, they just say don't try this test yourself. Okay, so don't put these tones on the air. I'm not. I don't know. Could you? Could you? Could you put the wrong tones on the air yourself? Oh sure, you could. Yeah, you could. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> it, it's happened. I, I think we. Let me see. It's just one of the stations I worked with. Yeah, I think we we're the recipient of wrong tones once. It actually, came from a state agency. They were using a broadcast EAS encoder and uh, mistakenly put the wrong codes in. And when we received it, we're looking at them, going, "Wow, that's something you don't see every day." It was for like a nuclear disaster, nuclear. Uh, um, nuclear plant disaster or something like wow oh, we don't even have one in that area that they just transmitted from <laughs> so yeah you can there's also easily there's more information at, at the end of the video that we didn't go to the whole video is uh, almost eight minutes long so we didn't show the whole thing uh but at the end there's a uh, there's a url to go to it's a it's a best practices guide for the eas national test toolkit uh, it's a fema.gov url it's a slash and a bunch of stuff and a slash and a bunch of stuff and a slash and a bunch of stuff so we don't give it out here but uh, go look at the video after the show and uh, we'll link to it in the show notes. And hey, there you go. You should uh, watch that stuff and 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 be pretty prepared. All right, uh, Chris. I think we're going to move on to a, a different subject now that we've uh, pretty well killed all this EAS stuff. I, just, I hope it goes well. Just do a little prep. Make sure you know, Chris. I should ask this question: If you're getting your your monthly tests okay, should this test work? Or well, I guess you got to check and make sure your programming's right to to decode and 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 forward the EAN. Yeah. That's correct. But if you, okay. if you are getting your monthlies and folding them properly, the, the, the only thing you have to do is program the EAN, you're, you're in good shape. So, yeah, you should be 98% you know, of the way there. Okay. Well, this test occurs on November the 9th. Uh, that's a Wednesday. So we'll get to talk about it in a couple of weeks from now, uh, about three weeks or so from now. We'll see, uh, we'll see how it went and, uh, and review our performance as, as broadcasters. I don't know if the data will all be in, in the, by then yet. Well, uh, we got a couple of other subjects to uh, chat about. Um, and Chris, I'm not sure, uh, this thing about an IntelliLink, uh, kind of give us a little overview of what you're talking about and we'll, um, uh, we'll pick it up from there. Oh, yes. Uh, Buick uh, GM division is introducing IntelliLink uh, in 2012 and 2013 uh, vehicles. And what it does is it allows you through Bluetooth to connect your you know, favorite audio devices to the car, to the car's audio system and interact. And I believe it's also, last I checked, uh, offering Wi-Fi connectivity. Well, that's, that's the goal for it. 
And then also it'll offer you connectivity through your uh, XM, I think, uh, subscription. Uh, the reason I was bringing it up as a topic is just that as broadcast engineers, it's something we have to consider, you know, where people get their audio and, or their content from. And once you can make the, the vehicle more than just an AM, FM radio device, or we'll say AM, FM satellite radio, and offer up other options that you have with you, like your smartphone technology, it changes the game, the landscape. So I just thought it'd be good for everyone to hear about it. You know, look it up. It's in, uh, you'll see in the Radio World website. And it's have all the websites talking about it. And it's just, it's like Ford Sync and a few other things that are coming out that everybody, now the automotive, automotive industry is shifting. And it's now putting things like this in the vehicles. As you know, they're on a three to five year cycle. So if they're putting it in this 2012 model year, that means they've been working on it now for three or four years. So they've probably got it working really well and perfected. So just, just uh, that's basically what I was just trying to bring to everyone's attention. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Hey, I was noticing one more thing in the news before we uh, head, to, head to commercial. Um, the FCC has slashed a pirate's uh, fine to $250, and it was ten grand. Uh, boy, <laughs> what? I mean, gee, money. a Florida man will have to pay only $250 instead of the original $10,000 penalty for operation of an unlawful radio station. Uh, Thomas Moray had been slapped with a notice of apparent liability. That's, that's the legal term, a notice of apparent liability for operating. Uh, by the way, if you got a notice of apparent liability, would you apparently pay it? Um, for operating on 88.3 megahertz from his garage for two to three weeks. Well, that, that's not very, that's not so flagrant. I mean, there's people been on the air for years, it seems like, as pirates. The regional director of the South Central Region for Enforcement Bureau of the FCC accepted the documentation submitted by Maury and his attorney that he is in no position to be able to pay the fine. Well, how much did he spend on his transmitting gear? Can, can you transmit for $250? I guess you probably can. You can, you can get. Uh, yeah, you the, could. You could. Depends the on power level you're trying to get. The story doesn't say, uh, uh, yeah, what, how much how much power he was uh, he was running here. I don't know, two hundred fifty dollars. That just that doesn't seem like much at all, um, huh? Well, uh, in a similar story, Florida's been a particularly favored spot, you know, for radio pirates. Um, they the SEC uh, announced uh, a few months ago that they have a total of fifty thousand dollars. That's five ten thousand dollar fines in separate cases of unlicensed stations. Uh, let me see if I can find this uh, the same one. Oh yeah, Thomas L. Morey operated an unauthorized station from his garage in St. Petersburg, Florida. Oh, I, I played good music. Um, uh, now there's no more. There's there's no more no more information as to what power level he's running. But from his garage, I mean, how much? I don't know. He probably he, he didn't have a big transmitter. Probably had, maybe had a, a Ramsey kit or something. It, it, yeah, this whole idea of, of, of pirate stations, of course, licensed broadcasters uh, are not in favor of, of this at all. I mean, licensed broadcasters went through a whole lot of trouble to get their license. Uh, you know, all kinds of legal fees and application fees. And finally, you get or maybe you had to buy the license from somebody else or get it at an auction. Uh, I mean, even in small town America, it's easy to pay one hundred thousand dollars for a license to run a radio station. Uh, and then you got to build the station. Uh, gone are the days um, when when uh, you could just ap apply for a license and get it. Now they all go through auction, and and uh, in fact, I always found found this kind of d distressing. Before the um, before the uh, uh, the Communications Act of I want to say it was 1996. This is back during the Clinton ad administration. Before that happened, um, anybody or his brother could petition the FCC to allocate a frequency to some town if that frequency would be available. And then that same person could, and unfortunately anybody else could too, could go apply for a license for that frequency. So again, it's a two-step process. You had to petition the FCC to allocate a frequency. I'm talking about the FM band here and, and TV as well. Allocate a frequency to a town. And that frequency, again, had you had to show that, hey, this frequency will fit. It'll cover that town from you know a location in this area, and it won't interfere with anybody else and it meets all the rules. And hey, if you were putting a, a station in, you know, West Undershirt, Montana, no problem. You could find a frequency that would go in. East of the Mississippi River in the U.S., not so easy to, to work a station in, uh, although it's, it certainly has been done, uh, you know, even in, 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 the la well, in, in the last 15 years or so, it certainly has been done. West of the Mississippi, lots of places where a station would fit. Well, you could do all this, and I, with my business partner, uh, Larry Fuss, uh, we obtained a number of licenses this way, petitioned the FCC, to put it here, uh, be the successful applicant for it, and 
uh, then you got a license, and all it cost you was the application fees and the engineering fees. And if your partner is a, a you know an FCC engineer who can you know do the studies, then you know the costs become fairly minimal at that point. Well, um, that all changed with the auction process. You know now now the poor guy can't get a radio station license because it's going to cost you tens of thousands of dollars at a minimum to bid for a license at auction. And that's how the FCC distributes license nowadays. They are auctioned off. And there's favoritism in the auction process, favoritism given to certain classes of, of, of applicants uh, for these. So, um, I, I, you know, it, back before 96, when people would, I hear people complaining, hey, uh, poor man can't get a radio station. How much, you know, it's only for the big companies. Well, no, that wasn't true before 96. Before 96, you could get a radio station. No, it wouldn't be in New York, and it wouldn't be in Tampa, Florida, and it wouldn't be in Seattle or, uh, or Portland or, or Los Angeles. But you could get a radio station. I was able to get a part ownership in a total of 11 radio stations. Um, and it just wasn't all that expensive. But now, sorry, it's expensive now. Uh, they, they have these auctions, uh, the, the auction process, and uh, the bidding goes up pretty fast on some of these. Um, there was a station that we were interested in in Mississippi, and the bidding went uh, up to close to half a million dollars for the license in Greenville, Mississippi. Small town, 70,000 people, maybe 50,000 people. I don't know. You know it's just e economically, I just don't understand how that could work out. And uh, the folks who ended up getting the license ended up getting it at a bit of a bargain uh, because they, well, they had some set-asides for them and, uh, we, and we couldn't get it. And so anyway, they got it and um, they're not doing so well. They got a big debt service to pay on that expensive license. I don't think it's a very good process. You know, it, it now it certainly is a process of uh, whoever has the money can get the license. Um, uh, on the one hand, I say it's not a very good process. Uh, if you put money into it, surely you're going to want to uh, develop it and use it and make the most of it. You're going to have incentive to get that done. Whereas if you didn't have much into it, um, okay, maybe that incentive's not not there so strongly. Here, I'm, I'm rambling on. Chris, you got any feelings about this? You you know much about the license uh, licensing process? Uh, yeah, the, the what you spoke of is absolutely true. Uh, prior to 1996, you'd had a fair chance to. Uh, Get into the get into the broadcast industry, get on the airwaves, uh, serve the public in the form that the original Communications Act, I think, of 1934 was about. Uh, but since then, yes, the auctioning is. I always say, follow the money. You know, who benefits from this whole change of uh, legislation that took place? And that's what's sad about it. And you're right, there are favors. Uh, the you know, in auctioneering, and there are many ways to uh, game the system. And uh, people have definitely done that, and you're right. Stations that auction off at a price at multiples that are far greater than the revenue they'll ever receive is a waste of time and, and is bad business. But yet we seem to be liking that for some reason. Uh, well, that same administration, yeah. you know, that same administration that repealed, well, not repealed, but uh, enacted that new change, the same administration that removed certain financial restraints on the finance industry. And here we are today with some issues. So there's, there's where my line from follow the money comes into play. Yeah. Well, it, certain and, things and, need to be regulated. Yeah, I, I do recall that, um, uh, well, it, when, when consolidation started to occur, this was the part of the, 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 the Telecom Act of 96 that allowed, um, that allowed big conglomerates like Clear Channel and, 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 and Citadel and Cumulus and CBS and, and, and others to uh, get a lot of stations in a market. There are still limits, but to have a lot of stations in a market. And, you know, I'm not saying that's particularly a bad thing or a good thing. I'm just saying that's, that's the way it was. And this was during the Clinton administration. I'm, su I'm surprised, maybe I shouldn't be, but I'm surprised that uh, the, the, the administration, led by the guy that said, I feel your pain, um, that, that people v voted for him thinking that he was, he was there for the little guy. Well, during that administration, the rule came to pass that basically eliminated the little guy from ever getting a radio station uh, unless he just mortgaged everything he had to, to get. I mean, paid way more than... Um, uh, than, than he should have. Now, uh, he, look, I get th there's, a, there's a lot of philosophy of, about this. Uh, you know, folks who know me know that I'm basically a libertarian and, and hey, I'm, I'm if, on, on the one hand, the way it was before uh, cost very little to get, but you know what? Uh, the, the government hadn't done anything to Im improve its, its value. In other words, an entrepreneur had to get it and then improve its value and then sell it for more later on. That's fine. 
but but to, to auction it off now and and so many speculators get in the game and and uh, the the price can go way way up. Um, people asked about what are, what are the set asides. Well, the set asides were basically if you were a minority bidding for it, you automatically got something like twenty five percent off off the final price. So me bidding for it. Um, if my bid was uh, four hundred thousand dollars, I had to pay four hundred thousand dollars. If a minority bid for it, uh, they would bid four hundred thousand dollars, and they had to pay three hundred thousand dollars. So that was the, 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 and there were other set asides too. Uh, I'm not sure of what they all were, but um, anyway, just didn't seem like a, a fair uh, or a, a good process. It just seemed like antithetical to um, the way that we had uh, been doing things in, in, in the past. Oh, well, it's, it's the way it is. Now, if you want to buy a radio, well, now if you want to buy a radio station, there certainly are some at, uh, uh, at, at, at fire sale prices. I could probably well, name some. Well, fire sale price. Uh, well, um, uh, a couple hundred grand. You can get a radio station for a couple hundred grand. I mean, that's like equipment and everything. That's tower building equipment, everything. You can easily buy a station. Well, in fact, in fact, uh, my business partner just okay. sold uh, a station for $150,000, an AM station. Excellent. And that included Excellent. the tower and the transmitter site and the, the property that the transmitter site's on and the goodwill and the license. Uh, speaking of which, out, you know, the person will turn in the license, sell the property and make four times the value. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to read, trying to read the, the chat room. Uh, Na Navion asked, uh, you used to have to prove you could operate the station without any income for some period of time. I don't think that's the case anymore. You, you don't have to no, show it's that. Not. That's, that's yeah. long gone. Long gone, and there used to be there used to be the process of comparative hearings. Remember back in the day when I said anybody and his brother can apply for an open license. Um, if if several people did, then you'd have to go to a court and have a comparative hearing, and those certainly happened quite a bit. There was a lot of shenanigans, you know, played played there too. Um, uh, uh, so I'm not sure. I'm not. Sure. You know, how do you give away? How do you how do you allocate a precious resource? You know, on the one hand, okay. You know, the the libertarian in, in me says, you know, money's not a bad way to do that. <laughs> Whoever's going to pay the most money for it uh, is probably going to do the best job with it because uh, they they've got a lot invested in it. So I don't know. Well, that know. the Communications Act of 1996 pretty much made radio and TV a commodity. And once you do that to anything. It no longer becomes what it was. It's just what you think it could be, and the prices go through the roof. The value, the um, the expectations are no longer realistic. And as I worked for, I was employed by a radio station that was at the beginning of that whole process, and we were producing, let's see, uh, after after expenses and everything else, for about a million two a year in in the revenue. It was about a two million two station in, in total gross sales. At the end of that wonderful uh, consolidation and uh, crazy speculation craze, stations sold for approximately $10 million. And since that day has yet been able to show a profit or do anything and has changed ownership, has lost its stature in the community, and now I believe is um, basically automated. But yeah. prior to that, the station was producing both for the community, both economically, both as a business, uh, and every year it, it did its thing. It, it did what it was supposed to do and, and made money as it's supposed to as a private entity. But after it became a commodity, the expectation was, oh, well, right now the industry is four times multiple. It's like, you know, folks, let's be realistic here. The marketplace has about a $5 million base if you're lucky and you're sharing it with 10 other people. You know, if you get a third of it, you, you know, great, you know, good, good luck. You're selling the place and expect it to be able to produce $10 million a year. No, not happening. And that was the start of it back in the, uh, you know, back 88, 87, 89. And then slowly it crept up. And then when the you know, Communications Act came along, it just accelerated it even more. And you're right. When you lift those restrictions, what, what do you have? Right? I worked at a radio station that was locked out of a venue, pushed out of a, a venue that we had access to through a contract, through payment. You know, you paid for access because the new owners of that, um, what do you call it, entertainment company, were also the new owners of the radio stations that now were owned in the market because they were allowed to own the entertainment, broadcast, and something else. And guess what? They broke the contract with us, said, that's it, we're done. Here you go, we'll pay out the penalty, goodbye. And our competitor got, the, uh, got access. Where's the pl level playing field there? Totally legal, ethical, moral, probably not, but 
that's what started and that's how things have gone and now look at you know that's what you have today and you're right you you're lucky if you can get yourself a station and do it right and, and make money or even prosper in any form or shape because the speculation or the expectations are way out of uh, you know out of left field in the chat room, uh, Web 349 uh, says a station used to have to operate in the public interest, but not anymore due to deregulation. Well, I, I would challenge that statement. Um, a station still has to maintain a public file, and that public file now has to be available on the Internet if a station has an Internet presence. So there's actually a bit more work to do. It all has to be scanned and done electronically. Um, if someone comes in and wants to see the public file, they have to be able to see the public file. If they want to make copies of the public file documents, then a reasonable accommodation has to be made for people to, to receive copies of that. Do people actually come in and, and look for the public file? Almost never know. And if there is, it's always you, it's often something personal. You know, like the general manager's ex-wife comes in and says, I want to see the public file. Uh, not knowing about anything in it. Uh, and the public file still has to have um, uh, issues and program lists maintained, for example. So there, there are uh, requirements that a station has to do, and I, I think they're fairly antiquated. I mean, if you've got a half million dollars in a small town radio station just for the license, it's not including the tower, which is another four hundred thousand dollars, and the and and land and building and transmitter and and uh, what uh, you know studio space and all that kind of stuff. If you've got that kind of money tied up, are you not going to operate in the best interest of of the people who you're serving in your town? I, I think generally yes, and if, and if you're not. You don't deserve to make money. You're probably not going to make money, and you're going to end up losing money, and you're going to end up selling the selling the radio station, hopefully to somebody who will take better care of it. I don't know. What do you think? No, that's true. That's true. Well, you know, back in the day, you had these rules in place to ensure level playing fields that, yes, you were serving the interests of the public, and there was some metrics to follow that you can verify it. And by having an open book policy, if you will, and public inspection file, as it's called, you could do that. You knew that, you know, you could try and be uh, hanky-panky, double books, whatever you want to call it. But at the end of the day, if somebody walked in and said, I would like to see the public file, I'm a, you know, a member of the community, and you didn't produce the file as it should be, they had you dead to rights. I mean, legally. So you know, they kept you, kept you honest. But today's public file has been watered down considerably. And yeah, you still have to maintain it. But you know, you're right. I don't know how many people probably call and ask about it anymore. Because in the day, if your license was up for renewal and you had a, you know, a chance for a comparative hearing, the public file inspection was the first place everybody went. Today, it won't do much for you <laughs> with the auctions and the way everything is set up. Yeah, well, the, 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 the different theories being chat bandied about in the chat room and statements being made, and, and you know, there, there's a lot of sides to to these uh, to these stories and where we are with broadcasting, and and you know, as a broadcaster, as a license holder, uh, part of a license holder myself, um, it 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 does it, it's always gotten a bit uh, uh, under my skin that broadcasters, radio and television, terrestrial broadcasters, um, have standards to adhere to that say newspapers don't. You know, any, anybody and his brother can go start a newspaper. You can go start a penny saver. Uh, you can publish whatever you want. And, and there's, there's almost no restrictions whatsoever on doing that. Maybe you have to get a local business license. But you can buy a printing press or hire that out and print whatever you like. Distribute it, sell it, wh whatever you want. But if you're a broadcaster, oh, there's this precious commodity. It's the public airwaves, which, um, you know, there's, that's a whole subject in, in, in itself, too. Um, uh in in the end, in the end, does the public file make any difference? Yes, a couple of stations have lost licenses because of poor maintenance of the public file, or they've lost challenges to their license uh, because they haven't addressed the issues of the uh, the local community. Um, which I, you know, I don't know. I, I think it's a lot of hogwash myself. People, so people in the chat room are, are asking: um, Is is radio the buggy whip manufacturer of the 1900s? And Okay, there's some evidence to so say, yeah, it's the beginning of the end for radio. But there's other folks who would point out, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Radio listening among, let's see, among the, the young dynamic folks, 18 to 34, is up now more than ever. Uh, it's up over last year. It's up over the year before. Um, uh, we, we thought, you know, we thought that uh, eight tracks would, would kill radio. We thought that cassette tapes would kill radio. We thought that television or MTV would kill radio. And yet people are still listening to radio by the millions and millions and millions every single day. So I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not standing up crowing and proud and say, and, and say hey, look at me, I'm king of the, king of the hill here. But um, there's, there's not 
um, there's not evidence for for erosionness. Good Sound says podcasting will kill radio. Well, hey, I listen to podcasts a lot. Still listen to radio a lot too. You, you, have, you have thoughts about about radio where it's going before we, we hit our commercial? In terms of listenership, hey Lisa. <laughs> Sorry about that. Like the <laughs> disruption plan here. The, the buggy whip analogy for radio is it's not radio itself, not the uh, the medium. It's probably more of the the programming and what people try to do with it. Uh, radio is going to be around for a while. It, and listenership has been up and down. Um, it's probably more st it's probably more stable than most other media out there when it comes to listeners, uh, even compared to viewership on say a web or TV. But I, I think what's, what the buggy whip thinking should be applied is where programming comes into play. That's the part that people are like, just like, wow, you know, no, nothing's changed there. And yet everything around us continues to change. You know, the products like from Steve Jobs is a you know, point, point in case, case yeah. in point, that is. Hey, I, when we come back from commercial, I, I've got some thoughts about, you know, satellite radio was going to kill terrestrial radio. Hey, $10, $12 a month. Uh, 100 channels, then it became 200 channels or some such, and that was going to kill kill local local radio. Um, and, and there's some good, there's a lot of good comments in the chat room right now. I want I want to get to those, but first I want to tell you about the sponsor of our show, which is my employer, Telos. And I'm I'm kind of excited about some things that I picked up in Amsterdam at the uh, the IBC convention there. I'm actually not going to talk so much about Telos. I'm going to talk about this company that has partnered with Telos, and, and there are a number of companies which have partners with Telos and uh, and also with, with Axiom uh, to come up with some interesting third-party solutions for broadcasters. One of them is uh, this company, and I'll hold this up here, it's Broadcast Bionics. These are some really cool people. I've been to their, lo to their office, their, their laboratory in um, in England, it's uh, in Hayward's Heath. Remember, remember when they had that mad cow disease outbreak in, in England? This is the farm next door. <laughs> so, but they, 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 there's no mad cows there now, actually. There is a, a beautiful laboratory where they develop fantastic software and some hardware solutions. And um, let me uh, see if I can put this back in front of the camera here. Uh, sorry about this. This is, you know, well, I'm glad Broadcast Box isn't paying for this commercial. Uh, it, it's not really high class, is it? Uh, Intercom Plus is a really cool solution. You know, Tele or Axia has these intercom units that uh, connect up to uh, an Axia live wire network. Well, if you have several different locations of studios that are disparate, you know, distance from each other, and you don't have, you know, uh, fiber between these locations, but you have, you know, ordinary internet or WAN type services, well, you can connect these locations together um, for intercom purposes. So you can just punch a, a talk to button on your on your Axia intercom, and through a, a through a gateway, through an MPEG gateway, uh, your audio gets you know cranked down to more manageable bit rates. Uh, goes through the uh, the internet or the WAN, and then uh, shows up at the intercom unit of who you want to talk to in a, a distant city or halfway around the world or you know a, a, a across uh, across town. Uh, what's also cool about this solution for broadcast bionics is that the names of who you're talking to show up properly uh, at the at the distant studios. You, you program how that shows up. And so, you know, it, it doesn't help you if you see, you know, Studio One's calling you. Well, it could be Studio One, you know, next to down the hall from you. Well, this ends up saying, you know, Site A Studio One or, you know, uh, uh, Radio 5 or WXYZ Studio One. So it, it takes care of little housekeeping things like that. Um, very cool solution. Intercom Plus from Broadcast Bionics. Um, Another, another solution. You know, I've talked on this show before about the, the Telos VX voice over IP SIP phone system. And some folks need more lines and, and more studios than one of the Telos VX engines can handle. So the folks at Broadcast Bionics have this, this glue, this, uh, this software that, that's running on a, on a PC platform that ties a bunch of VX engines together. So now, oh, and it can tie them uh, together, by the way, even over distance. Um, so you can manage phone lines uh, across uh, across distance and, and uh, do a show today from one city that you normally do from another city. Take phone calls as if you were in the normal city. Uh, just lots of lots of cool solutions uh, with with that. In fact, other broadcasters, big broadcasters, are looking at 
these kind of things to help them run their operations. Uh, CBC in Canada is looking at, at solutions like that, and, and the BBC is a, as well. There's one more thing, and we don't usually talk so much about free stuff, but here's something that's absolutely free uh, from uh, Broadcast Bionics and from, from Telos. It's this uh, X-Screen uh, call screening software. It does come free when you buy uh, a Telos phone system like, uh, like an NX12 or an NX6 phone system. Uh, it comes free with this X screen light uh, software, which uh, which is you know phone call screening software. So that's a that's a pro joint project with the folks at uh, at Broadcast Bionics. I'm really high on this company. If if you would check them out, a lot of their products work with a lot of our products at, at Telos. Uh, Broadcast Bionics is uh, is the the dealer in the UK uh, in England um, uh, for uh, for Telos products and uh, Omnia products and for Axia products. So they they know what they're doing and they're really good programmers. They've even added some extra screens to Axia element consoles, giving them more functionality than they had before. Specific little uh, things that, that UK broadcasters wanted. So I'm, I, I'm really high on these guys. Good folks, and, and if you check them out, I would appreciate it. And this message, though, has not been paid for by them. It's been paid for by uh, Telos uh, Systems on the web at telos-systems.com. By the way, before the show is over in just a few minutes, uh, we're going to give away tonight two licenses for Omnia AXE software. This is a uh, streaming software with audio processing built in. Runs on a Windows platform, runs as a service, so it's unobtrusive in the background, and it will uh, take uh, in ingest audio by a whatever audio card you have or by live wire and spit it back out as a compressed stream in uh, any of the normal formats you like. We'll be giving that away very shortly, and thanks for all the folks who are retweeted. All right, um, Chris, what we're going to talk about. I, that's, I, I said um, it just before we went to break. <laughs> I forgot sorry, all about it. I should have wrote it down. I did not. Yeah. Well, maybe the chat room will uh, will, will, will will remind. What's that? Is it, no, I just said, oopsie. I just uh, blanked out on that. I was just writing some other notes for us. Oh, somebody well, in the, the chat room says... The, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll go ahead. Oh, well, somebody ahead. in the chat room uh, said... Uh, in fact, Navion says, Too bad Omni AXE is on Windows, but it works like a champ. Well... Uh, on our commercial next week, I'll tell you about something really cool. In fact, well, here, I love to just move the camera around just, just a sec here and show you something. You see that? You see that? That is a Telos ProStream, and that is R&D unit number three. Soon to be produced, soon to be out the door as a, uh, as a, as a, as a full, you know, consumer unit, well, broadcast unit, it has, uh, it, it's, it's an appliance, a one rack unit appliance. You put audio into it, you get streaming out. And it has Omnia processing built in. And of course, it has all the, all the Fraunhofer uh, codecs built into it. So that's really cool. We'll be talking about that at uh, the AES convention. But it's, it's up, it's working. Uh, a couple of folks around the world have been streaming from it and listening to it uh, from here. I can't dare not give you the URL because you'll overwhelm it. <laughs> Sure. So we'll be talking about that next time. Thanks, Navion, for, for, for bringing, bringing that up. All right. Where were we, Chris? Help me out. Uh-oh. Well, let's see. There's the, uh, the infamous spectrum issue with the broadcasters losing out to the FCC and the auctions. Is that word again? Auctions. That, uh, that keeps rearing its head. And the NAB, I think, now is uh, citing some type of survey that was done with the Citicorp folks saying that there is no crisis going on with the phone carriers and everybody's crying wolf now. I don't know if you've heard anything or what you, if anyone's talked to you or if you've been following that, but it's been no, chaotic sorry, here in the city. A, this is not an issue that, I, that I've been up on except for hearing occasionally about, uh, about t you know, taking away TV spectrum. Is that what, you, what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, now there's a report out that I think the let's see, Commerce, Commerce Department has identified 1,500 megahertz of federal spectrum for further evaluation for wireless broadband. So let's uh, get yes, this it's straight. And, and, and is there's, it... There's, uh -huh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. This is what? Well, I was, of course, if you ask, is it needed? Well, that depends on who you ask, right? Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting when you start reading details into some of these reports and you start to you know, take a bird's eye view, you realize, wait a minute, the, per, the, the folks who currently have Spectrum aren't even using all of it currently. So why are they asking for more? And then all of a sudden there's the crisis. There's no Spectrum out. They were running out of it. We're losing it. And then... You get this announcement, oh, by the way, there's 1,500 megahertz available sitting out there that the feds are sitting on and doing nothing with. Oh, so now what do we do? Do we still rape the, uh, the broadcast TV folks from Spectrum? Maybe even AM and FM at some point? 
or do we look at this other 1500 megahertz and say, well, can this be used? It's just, I, I don't, I cannot believe there's a crisis the way the carriers, and I'll just use that word, claim there, there is because of, I don't believe that they're even using their spectrum they currently have efficiently when you start reading about how the technology can be deployed and what can be done with it. And it's just amazing what doesn't happen. So I just, it, nothing's adding up properly. But it's the big buzzword right now. The NAB is getting involved with the CTIA. Uh, the, is it, that's the, uh, what do you call it, the folks with the wireless um, communications technology industry or something like that. So, you know, they're all up in arms and they're, going, they're batting it, battling it out in Washington. That's the latest. Well, m my opinion for what it's worth is that I, I think that in the long run, um, every ounce of spectrum that, that is available and, and can be made efficiently available for mobile, um, mobile connectivity, um, mobile internet, mobile, whatever kind of connectivity we have now and in the future. Uh, I, I think that's where things are going. And I'm, I'm not upset about that. Now, it doesn't mean now I, I'm, I'm not interested in, in taking spectrum away from terrestrial broadcasters at this point. And I think we have about the right number of terrestrial broadcasters. Um, I don't think we necessarily need, uh, need a lot more. I don't think we need an, a, a lot less. Um, it's going to be interesting. Where are things going to land in, in 50 years? In 50 years, will we still have or need over-the-air TV stations, for example? Because most TV viewing is not mobile, at least not now and not in the U.S. Maybe in some other countries, there's a lot of mobile viewing. Um, you, you know, I, I, I do a little work with some local TV station, with a local TV station here in Nashville, and I asked the engineer, he was giving me a tour of, of the, the uh, the, uh, the, the, the big uh, back room where all the infrastructure is and all the servers. And um, we were walking by one rack and he pointed out a piece of gear. He says, that's the most important piece of gear in the station. I said, really? Uh, I would have thought maybe here the most important piece of gear would be uh, your master control switcher or your STL to the, uh, to, the, to the transmitter site. He said, well, that piece of gear right there, and I forget what it was, so some kind of, uh, of uh, a fiber modulator. He said, that piece of gear carries our signals, uh, actually all three of them, across the street to Comcast. And uh, if we lose the transmitter, uh, we've lost, I don't know what it might have been, we've lost 8% of our audience. If we lose this box, we've lost 92% of our audience. I'm making these numbers up, but it was some very high number like that. So w at what point do we no longer need TV transmitters to, I mean, at, at what point are we spending all this money for tower and, and spectrum and electricity to hit 300 people over the air. True. True. I don't know. That's a, that's a I, question that's being pondered by the TV folks. I, I know, you know, if you look at an example here in New York City, when, uh, you know, we had a, the 9-11 the incident, uh, the collapse of the building, that's where all the broadcasters were transmitting from, and only one broadcast, I happen to have an old site available at the Empire State Building, fired that up and they had more people, just as many people watching there as they were on cable. Everybody else was transmitting to the cable head ends. And that's, that's how people got their stuff. But, uh, you know, it's, yeah, you're right. 50 years from now, viewing will definitely be different. I mean, right now you got Apple's iOS 5 coming out with the iCloud and the part of the game changing element there is mobile TV. So, you know, will that be the, uh, the, the driving force to move people off of what we're accustomed to and, you know, TV viewing and now make it more mobile. And if it becomes mobile, where's the, the connectivity? Over a carrier, phone carrier, or some other type of technology? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm, I've grown up with, my career has been about this, this notion of broadcasting, not, not TCP IP connections, although, hey, I'm fully familiar with that kind of stuff, but this notion of one-to-many broadcasting where it doesn't matter how many receivers are out there, it doesn't cost any more for anybody's infrastructure for there to be 10 receivers or 10 million receivers. The signal is still, you know, blowing by your antenna and you can still pick it up. Um, uh, that, I think, is a very interesting and very efficient model. Of course, it's also a very one-way model, and everybody's watching the same thing at the same time. Um, as people are in community, uh, that's not such a bad thing. You know, what happened, uh, are, are the days gone when we say, hey, did you see Lost last night? Hey, did you see uh, uh, Terra Nova last night? Hey, did you see the new CSI last night? Um, uh, or Dancing with the Stars, or whatever's the hip popular thing lately. There, there is that sense of community, um, uh, that that non real time stuff, or or fragmented things like the internet don't tend to to bring us so much. I, I gotta believe though, at some point, at some point in the future, 
you know, is it 20 years out? Is it 200 years out? At some point, we're, we, well, do you think we're going to have a, a more unified structure? Will everything be IP or will everything be something that we haven't found yet? Or will we, I guess this is probably the way it's going to go, we will always have overlapping, somewhat fractured technologies, uh, the oldest ones like the buggy whips, you know, not being used anymore. Uh, you know, uh, uh, long wave radio, for example, pretty much shut down around the world. AM radio, you know, so many AM talk stations are moving to an FM uh, in, in their city of license, uh, you know, in, in, in their market. When will we see AM go away? When will eventually we, we see FM go away and, and everybody is on some kind of cellular streaming service for their car, for their personal radio to, to fill up their, their iPod with uh, something that, you know, the, the latest local news, the latest national news, and they can just, you know, get it when they want to. I don't know. I, 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 I got I to gotta believe that someday there won't be any more tr FM transmitters around, but there will be a way to get... Uh, anything you want um, on a on a portable device, and you and it'll be simple. And I gotta believe that there's going to be ways to um, experience new um, entertainment, and still, when it, if if you want to, hey, twice an hour, you're still going to get news. Yeah, you know, I still I, I may still want top of the hour news. Um, I may want the three minute version, not the five minute version. I may want at the bottom of the hour. I may really want to have one minute of local news. What did the city council do last night? Uh, what was what was the siren going by uh, my my house last night? What was that about? Wouldn't that be cool if if we could, not in a not in a complicated way, but in some simple way, be able to program what we hear and yet leave room to experience new things? You, you see any infrastructure or system like that in our future? I believe so. I believe you'll see that probably coming out of the, the WiMAX LTE technologies that are currently evolving. Uh, current, you know, even the current TV transmission, the HD stuff, uh, the way it's transmitting, it, once it becomes a packetized stream or carrier, there's a lot you can do with it. There's probably, I would say, two or three technologies out there that could easily be uh, employed to offer that up. And then you can have the back channel through your um, you know, cell phone connection, your internet connection, broadband. So you can have an interactive experience that way. So you can still do the one to many and then have the back channel return in a more efficient way than you may have done, say, five years ago or 10 years ago uh, with dial-up modems as a method that's still, well, actually it's still used by some of the folks in TV. But uh, you know, I, I, I think you'll see a hybrid. I don't, I don't think there'll be a one-shot removal, but it'll be a hybrid all throughout. That, that's pretty much where it comes from, where it's going to go. Yeah, mm. there so many aspects of this we could aspects of this that we could we could talk about, and I, I'm I'm I really want to know what all this tech, all this entertainment distribution, looks like years and years from now. I have no idea how it's going to look, and, and I don't know how you predict that. Uh, um, uh, there's financial interest. There's people with a lot of assets tied up. Um, and and then then there's you know we we're always pushing the limit like like the Twit Network like what Leo's doing pushing the limit of a newer technology to supplant to get around the older technology and and all the the baggage and the weight that goes along with uh, with a traditional uh, a cable TV network uh, or even a, a, a terrestrial over, over the air type of station I don't know there, there's there's a lot to I, I think it's very exciting what what could um, the, the, what the future is going to hold, uh, even though it's going to be chaotic, I still think that's that's exciting. And I guess I'm going to stop my comments with that. We're out of time, and, and we should uh, uh, we, we we should we should <laughs> be quiet and let, let another you know, newer broadcaster come along. Maybe one that doesn't ha have any buggy whips a, 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 attached to it. Chris, do you have any final comments about where you think that this this thing, this entertainment thing, is going to go, and and when we can say goodbye to our transmitters? I'm um, I'm of the mindset that saying by the transmitters is going to be at least uh, probably 10 years out. I think uh, as we become more creative with our ways of distributing content or broadcasting, because you know broadcasting is more than just the radio and, and TV that we're aware of. But uh, I think with what you what you're seeing will be a metamorphosis of how people consume content, and those methods that they consume are going to stay around for a while because the easiest ones. These common denominator, the ones that you can get the, the quickest, are going to still be the ones that will survive if the content is there to support it. Just as you pointed out, I hear sirens go by in my local community. Where do I tune in to find that out? Oh, yeah, you know what? My, my radio station will have that before somebody else on the, uh, the web does. And, and until that 
changes, which is not going to happen that easily. I think you're going to see at least another 10 years worth of you know broadcasting as we know it uh, mechanically, but the content side will definitely evolve. I mean, once cars get Wi-Fi in them natively, and you can do USB control, Bluetooth control, and, and access the outside world while you're on the four, in, in the four wheels, that, that's when the things change around. But it's, again, you're not removing the transmitters anytime soon. I, I just think people in broadcasting have to get more creative with the content. Super Tech Steve in the chat room reminds us something that we should all have top of mind as, as whether we're broadcasters, netcasters, webcasters, or consumers of this kind of thing. And that is that, uh, thanks Super Tech Steve, content is king. Super Tech Steve didn't come up with that phrase. It's been around for a long time. But it's true. Content is king. And it doesn't matter. If the content is good, people will find a way to consume it. That's why the Twit Network is so popular among the hundreds of thousands of people who consume uh, uh, the programming that, that, that Leo has, uh, has created and allowed to create uh, on, on the Twit Network and other, other networks a, a, as well. And, you know, if I'm driving across the country late at night and, um, and, I, I, and I tune into an interesting uh, talk show on the radio, even if it's AM, I'll put up with Skywave and fading and those kind of effects just to hear what's going on. I remember years ago, I was driving across Kentucky, and I loved listening to the Larry King show when Larry was on Mutual Network late at night, overnight. And he had some very compelling uh, authors and, and, um, and other guests on his show. And I'd put up with all kinds of noise on that to hear it. And, and I, I guess... I guess I still do that today, not necessarily with AM radio, but um, with, with other forms. I, I go to efforts to, so I can have a, uh, an iPod in the car hooked to the stereo. Now, isn't that weird that, that I still refuse to get a satellite uh, uh, radio, an XM or Sirius in, in the car? And I guess my objection there is, is quality because the bit rates are so low. And, so, and, and maybe I just don't understand the, the content that's there. There's probably some compelling content that I'm just not aware of. All right, before I ramble on all night, I want to thank you for listening to this edition of This Week in, in Radio Tech. Chris Tobin from New York City, the best-dressed engineer in radio, is, has been our guest. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate well, you're it. You're welcome. Just one, uh, just one thing I need to mention. Yeah. Well, I just you have to say something. I just, just wanted to pass along because a lot of folks here in the New York City area knew we had a, a engineer, broadcast engineer, pass away suddenly this past Saturday. Yes. He, uh, so, yeah, he passed away of a sudden heart attack or body collapse. That's what we got. He was uh, a guy who did a lot of work here in town. And uh, if you're familiar with reading for the blind, that phrase, uh, there was an organization that went out of business. Uh, they went out of a reading, it was an in touch reading service, went out of business in 1992. He, he went along and co-founded another company called Gatewave that uh, picked up where they left off. So, uh, you know, not only did he do broadcast engineering for many New York City stations, he also served the community and the, the interest of the stations that he worked with. Uh, just just a, a note for everyone because uh, all of us here in New York City were taken back. And I had only talked to the guy literally a week earlier in person <laughs> at a transmitter site. And when I got word that he was, uh, he was gone, it was like, whoa, wow, that was... And, no signs of illness or anything, just collapsed uh, at a job site. Uh, one of his clients, he was a contract engineer. So it was uh, Richard Koziol here in New York City. I was wondering how to pronounce his last name, and, I, and that, there you go, Richard Koziol. Well, good yeah. deal. And I'm, 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 I'm sorry to hear that Richard passed away, and thank you for bringing that to our attention. Yeah, just a lot All of right. folks in town, the emails went yeah. back and forth. That's why I just thought I should say it. Ah. Uh, hey, um, uh, we have one last piece of business to do, and that is to give away two Omnia AXE software licenses, and this is pretty cool software. It's about uh, $400 list price, and, and it uh, runs on a Windows platform. It does run as a service, so uh, you, can, you can run it on a machine and, and, and kind of forget about it. Feed it some audio. Let the Omnia part process it. Let the E part, the encoding, um, encode it, and you've got a stream. And it can be used to fed a Shoutcast server or uh, all kinds of different services. And, and, and you can just use it for personal use or you can make it the basis for streaming all your stuff on the Internet. My little radio stations in American Samoa and in Mississippi, uh, we're using this software to process and stream uh, our stuff. We send it on to Shoutcast servers so that it's available all over the place. So, hey, Chris, give me a number between 1 and 15. 12. 12. 12. All right. Uh, let's see. Tahu FM. Let me write that down. Tahu FM. I don't think they're from here. I think they're from New Zealand. And give me another number between 1 and 12, Chris. 4. 4. 4. How about, um, well, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Mahalo Band. Mahalo Band. All right. Congratulations to Tahu FM and Mahalo Band. You're the winners of uh, this week's giveaway of Omnia AXE. Hey, in the future, I'm trying to work out with Telos. We're going to have a really big giveaway, like like 
so something really big. Hang on, we'll we'll, we'll take care of that. We got to get off the uh, off the air now, off the off the interwebs, the inner tubes, and we'll see you next week. Uh, next week we'll have some reports that came to us from uh, AES. Tom Ray and Chris Tarr should be back with us, so we hope you'll join us then for episode number one hundred and four. For now, that's us. For uh, that's it for this week in Radio Tech. Bye bye, everybody.